in virtual space. And thank you very much, Lucas, for the generous introduction. So today, I should like to take advantage of the seminar format, which I think is a good place for thinking aloud, for, uh, for speaking um, about ideas which one is not ready to publish, at least not in this particular form. So what you're going to hear is short and schematic, possibly provocative, definitely provisional. So let me start from the observation that what historians of knowledge study is plural rather than singular, as French and German recognize more easily than English, because I discover talking about knowledges still has to find general acceptance. Mm -hmm. And for a social historian of knowledge, as I claim to be, a central theme of research in this open area, definitely not a closed field, is the encounter between different knowledges, knowledges associated with different social groups, men and women, workers and management, colonized and colonizers, citizens and governments, and so on. Sometimes the result of the encounter is conflict, sometimes exchange, sometimes hybridization, the creation of what a recent um, book in German calls in English, pigeon knowledge. So today I'd like to speak about just one form of these encounters, local knowledges on one side, and on the other, what I have to call, for want of a better term, universal knowledge, meaning knowledges such as Western science, which the holders explicitly claim to be universal. Of course, this binary opposition, like most, if not all, binary oppositions, should really be imagined as two extremes, but with a lot of territory in between. And this binary is associated with other binaries that, there's no, that I have no time to discuss. Uh, depth versus breadth, concrete versus abstract, field versus study, micro versus macro. You can add to these yourselves. As you know, probably better than I do, Jan Golinski published a valuable study on the relation between local and universal knowledges in the natural sciences. But as far as I know, we still need a similar study that would focus on the humanities or the social sciences. The relation between the two kinds of knowledge, the two knowledges, is obviously different in the two cases, since in the case of the humanities and social sciences, a dialogue is possible between the researcher and the people he studies. Whereas in the case of the natural sciences, even chimpanzees do not give the ethologist any feedback. And in what follows, I shall be privileging the humanities and social sciences precisely because that field has not been explored in the same detail. Um, I think I imagine myself as contributing to what I'd like to call the emancipation of the history of knowledge from the, the shadow of its older brother or older sister, the history of science. And in any case, I, um, I've got more to say about the humanities and social sciences than I possibly could in the case of the natural or exact sciences. So local knowledge, it's an ambiguous phrase. Some people argue all knowledge is local since all knowers live somewhere. Others argue that local knowledge is a contradiction because if a statement is true, 
it has to be true everywhere. But despite these objections, it does seem quite useful to employ the, the phrase local knowledge to refer to knowledges of the geography, the history, and the natural history of particular territories. Knowledges that are more or less limited to local people. As for universal knowledge, it's a pity that one can't pronounce inverted commas. But whenever I use the word universal, please imagine that those inverted commas are there. Mm -hmm. So what have been the relations between these two kinds of knowledge? Taking an overview mainly of Europe, mainly the last 500 years, I shall offer a series of simple contrasts, simple enough to provoke discussion. In the first situation, which has been the dominant one over most of the period, holders of um, universal knowledge tend to reject alternative claims, claims that they associate with subordinate groups and their subordinate, subjected, or subaltern cultures. The attitude of, what, of the people I want to call the universalists was caricatured in the phrase of a satire on a 19th century Oxford professor, putting into his mouth the phrase, what I don't know is a knowledge. Let me take five kinds of example of this universalist attitude. In the first place, the Catholic Church, since alternative knowledges, unorthodox knowledges, or as the clergy would say, doctrines, they have generally been dismissed as so much heresy or superstition or paganism lumping together heretics, peasants, and the objects of missionary activity outside Europe, from China to Peru or Africa. Two, science. Many Western scientists have believed that their knowledge of nature is the knowledge of nature, rather than one kind of knowledge of nature. And they, again, like the church, dismiss alternative knowledges as magic or sometimes superstition. Third situation. Many Europeans have seen themselves as discovering the inhabitants of the rest of the world, rather than as also being discovered by those peoples a classic case of Eurocentrism, uh, criticized famously by the sociologist Fernando Ortiz, whose position as an upper-class Cuban allowed him to see both sides of the question. He said, when Columbus discovered America, the Americans discovered Columbus. Fourth example. Rulers and their officials, their bureaucrats, have often believed that they knew what was good for the people better than the people know themselves. Um, in England, the slogan, Whitehall knows best, an attitude that has often led to disaster. Uh, the best account of that kind of disaster I know is the set of case studies offered in Jim Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, which vividly reveal the problems that arise when national projects are carried out in ignorance of local conditions. To uh, Scott's rich list of examples from the 18th century, to the 20th, 
I should like simply and briefly to add one more. In Britain, there's the notorious ground, ground nuts scheme, which was launched in my childhood in 1947 by the Labour government and written off as a failure four years later. The plan was to grow peanuts in what was still a colony, uh, Tanganyika, now part of, of course, of Tanzania. The trouble was that the area that was cleared for the new crop, as the planners did not know, was a rather hard soil that there was little rainfall. And to make the situation still more difficult, the local workforce had never been trained to operate the imported machinery. Fifth example, disasters have also often occurred in warfare when the commanders of armies, especially of imperial powers, engaged in conflict with outside Europe. The generals often underestimated the enemy, partly because the enemy was not European and partly because they were not professional. The generals generally regarded local guerrilla forces as so many amateurs. And this hubris often led to nemesis. And to give you one more British example, the first Afghan war of 1839. In this case, the British army, more exactly, in 1839, the army of the East India Company invaded Afghanistan in order to keep out the Russians. There was a local rising against them and the army was forced to retreat. It was annihilated by the Afghan tribesmen who knew their rocky terrain intimately when the British did not. So those are some of the consequences of um, the um, uh, contempt, I should say, very often for local knowledges. But now I want to turn to the other side of the coin, because in this um, long arc of 500 years in Europe, um, in coexisting with the negative views that I've been summarizing, we find quite a number of individual scholars, scientists, missionaries, doctors, anthropologists, and others who were all generally, genuinely interested in the knowledges associated with other social classes and other cultures. So now I want to offer another set of five kinds of example, positive evaluations rather than negative. In the first case, Renaissance humanists. These humanists, generally dismissive of medieval knowledges, some of them did take an interest in the knowledge of artisans and peasants in their own culture. They learned from miners about mining, like Agricola. They learned from fishermen about fish, like Rondelet. They learned from peasants about plants. Or moving away from Europe to India or Mexico, uh, collectors of plants have obviously relied on the knowledge of locals, where to find particular plants and what their virtues were. And sometimes they even acknowledged this help. A famous case, which will be 
extremely familiar to some of you, is the book with um, entitled, if I translate it, as The Garden of Malabar, which is the book records the results of teamwork in Malabar, a team including both um, Dutch colonizers and Ayurvedic healers, a team put together by the governor of the territory, Henrik van Vreda. Second set of examples. During the Enlightenment, interest by elites in alternative knowledges increased. It's a kind of collective opening of the mind. Think, for instance, of the place of craft knowledges in the Encyclopédie. Of course, the work of Diderot, who, as you will remember, was himself the son of an artisan who made cutlery. Or think of the growing interest in, by some Europeans in Indian and Chinese knowledges in medicine or in philosophy. An interest in acupuncture, for example. And it's the, the concept, local knowledge it itself, goes back to the Enlightenment. The German jurist, Justus Mercer, used the term local vernunft, and he used it in a positive sense, because this term of his was employed in his critique of the pretensions to universal knowledge, which he associated with the French. Third series of examples. or rather counterexamples. In the 19th century, the relatively open-minded Enlightenment, uh, linked to their cosmopolitan ideal, was replaced by a narrower-minded one linked to the rise of nationalism, science, and imperialism. In medicine, the former interest in Ayurvedic healers and Chinese acupuncture was replaced by an attitude of superiority by European doctors who considered their approach was scientific and therefore it was the only one possible. It's true that Western scientists such as Darwin and Wallace relied heavily on indigenous knowledge to help them find what they were looking for outside Europe. But in this period, the scientists rare, rarely acknowledged this local help. But in the fourth place, in the 20th century, quite early in the 20th century, we see the beginnings of a return, at least a partial return, to the open-minded attitude of the 18th century. Taking local knowledges or indigenous knowledges seriously became institutionalized in the practice of ethnography, whether practiced by sociologists or by anthropologists. Clifford Geertz, of course, called his second volume of essays, Local Knowledge. Anthropologists relied on, but also increasingly acknowledged the work of their informants, interpreters, and assistants. I'm thinking of Franz Boas working among the Pakiotl on the Northwest coast of Canada and his references to his helper, George Hunt, who in spite of that English name, was a mestizo, half indigenous, and in an ideal position to mediate between the culture of the anthropologist and the culture of, let's say, the 
anthropologized. Or I'm thinking still more of the French anthropologist Marcel Griol writing about the Dogon in, of West Africa, but also giving a voice to one of the wise men of the Dogon so that um, Ogo Tameli gets a book of his own to um, explain um, his, um, the cosmos of his people. And I'm thinking too of the British anthropologist Victor Turner, who when writing about the Ndembu in East Africa, um, generously acknowledged the assistance of one informant, Muchona the Hornet, saying that it would have been impossible for him, Turner, to write his uh, book had it not been for the help offered by this man. Today, of course, this kind of acknowledgement is only prudent since in our increasingly global world, the informant is able to read and increasingly likely to read what the anthropologist has published. I turn now to my fifth and longest point. <clears throat> I'd like to suggest that the interest in local knowledge may itself be local. By this I mean to suggest that it's weaker in the centre and stronger on the periphery, um, where local intellectuals uh, may be Russian, may be Brazilian, may be Indian, have debate, debated for a long time whether or not to imitate the West in the sphere of knowledge as in other spheres. Some listeners now may object to the use of the term periphery. Once, once again, center and periphery, um, a binary opposition, which is useful only on condition that we're aware of what may lie in between. Uh, and the semi-periphery, as Emmanuel Wallerstein would say. But as I go on using the term periphery because it does name a widespread sense of exclusion, or at the very least, a sense of remoteness from important happenings taking place somewhere else. At any rate, to return to the main point I want to make now, there's an especially strong tradition of interest in local knowledges in Latin America. This interest might be described as traditional. It was already visible early in the 19th century when Andres Bello, a polymath living in what was just becoming Venezuela, wrote about what he called local knowledges, saberes locales. A little later in 1842, it was the turn of an Argentinian intellectual, Juan Batista Alberti, who published a book that might be described as a kind of Declaration of Independence for Latin American Philosophy, or as he called it, American Philosophy. Alberti argued, I quote, there is no universal philosophy because there is no universal solution to the problems which form its basis. For the sake of brevity, I'll now jump over a whole century to arrive at an example dating from 1945. Yeah. This time 
the intellectual is a Brazilian, the sociologist, historian, Gilberto Freire. It was in that year, 1945, that Freire published a textbook of sociology, an extremely um, unorthodox, not to say eccentric, textbook of sociology, which began by telling its readers that the best analyses of society had been made not by sociologists, but by novelists such as Marcel Proust. But there's a central argument to the textbook, which is relevant here. It, that is the critique of the Eurocentrism of previous textbooks on sociology. Generalizations about society that took examples almost entirely from the United States and from Europe. One and, and Freire rejected this. <clears throat> and one might add in parenthesis that the examples in most sociology textbooks um, don't even are not even taken from the whole of Europe, but mainly from its northwestern part, as was uh, pointed out by an irritated Hungarian reviewer of um, a textbook on sociology and, um, published a few years ago in Cambridge by Tony Gibbons. So Freire used the textbook as a kind of manifesto. He called for a future sociology that would take account of social realities all over the world, including, of course, Brazil. He called his enterprise the tropicalization of sociology. And his own studies in the social history of Pernambuco in the northeast of Brazil may be viewed as powerful local responses to the challenge of a universalist sociology. A generation later, in the age of post-colonial studies, Latin American intellectuals continued to stress the importance of local knowledges. In the year 2000, for instance, a Venezuelan sociologist, Edgardo Alander, edited a book making this general point and, in, and entitled for this reason, the coloniality of knowledge, la colonial, colonialidad del saber. Lander and his colleagues were trying, as they put it, to decolonize the social sciences, to introduce South American knowledges into the mainstream. Another Venezuelan, Fernando Coronio, wrote on what he called countering the center and going beyond Occidentalism. In Bolivia, yet another sociologist, René Zavaleta, was concerned um, in his, most of his career with revealing the value of local knowledge. And better known in the Anglophone, world, for obvious reasons that I'll mention in a moment, is the Argentinian scholar Walter Mignolo, who published in 1999 a book entitled Local Histories, Global Designs, concerned with what the author called coloniality, subaltern knowledges, and border thinking. So Mignolo, like uh, 
colonial like Lander has been trying to decolonize knowledge. Once upon a time, he once wrote, I'm quoting now, once upon a time, scholars assumed that if you come from Latin America, you have to talk about Latin America, that in such a case, you have to be a token of your culture. Such expectation will not arise if the author <clears throat> comes from Germany, France, England, or the USA. As we know, the first world has knowledge, the third world has culture, Native Americans have wisdom, Anglo-Americans have science, end of quotation. And maybe Mignolo was a bit too optimistic when he used the phrase, once upon a time. He surely realizes how much his own international reputation has owed to his migration from Argentina to the United States. He came from Argentina, he now comes from Duke University in North Carolina. He gets more readers, more listeners, than if he'd stayed in Buenos Aires. Today, so far as I can see, local knowledges have become more intellectually respectable than they used to be, with, but still without being universally accepted, rather like the idea of knowledges in the plural. For example, a few recent essays on what the authors call Southern theory have returned to the problem that was raised by Gilberto Freire 75 years ago. Although, as far as I can see, they've done less than he did to change the situation with positive examples. Integrating local knowledges of cultures and societies into social and cultural theory is a huge task. And although it's been begun, I think it still has a long way to go. At one time, it seemed that Western anthropologists would carry out the task, but then they abandoned their generalizing ambitions. And now many of them have also abandoned traditional ethnography. So who is going to take up the baton for the next stage in the race? The initiative in this task should really come from the periphery, where scholars are more conscious than their Western colleagues of what is missing from the textbooks of economics and politics, as well as from those of sociology. In an ideal situation, these scholars from the periphery would pool their knowledges at conferences in virtual space, which has the great advantage of geographical neutrality. Even though a discussion online is no substitute for sitting around a real table and accompanied by real drinks. I'm very sorry not to have been able to join those of you who are participating in person. In any case, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I would like to ask for, for applause, but that's very difficult online. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would like to, to suggest to have a short break, a couple of minutes, um, and then we resume 
at uh, 16, uh, uh, 22 our time. So five minute break. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we start with the uh, discussion. So thank you very much, and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Sorry, I'll just repeat it one, one more time for those who haven't heard. Um, so I thanked Peter for, for his talk and I propose to, to start with the discussion in now uh, four minutes. So we can stretch our legs and uh, resume in a couple of minutes with the discussion. So see you in a few minutes. Uh, Lucas, there's something called chat here, but it's switched off, it says, it's only available to team members. Yeah, no, we have a um, we have a problem with the with the chat function. Yeah. Um, so we will uh, I will uh, come back to this when we resume. So what I will do is we will ask people to ask their question and then I'll repeat a question for you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. See you in a, a couple of minutes. Um, hello, this is Karen Kuchler from Austria. I wanted to thank you so much for your lecture. <laughs> I have to go off. I have tutoring duties now. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to wait for the chat. Thank you for organizing this. Have a good day. Goodbye. Bye. Sorry, I didn't get any of that. Uh, no, she just uh, thanked you for the lecture and told us that she isn't able to join the discussion. Yeah. Because I have to go teach, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, bye now. Bye. Bye. Okay, um, so this was the five minute break. Um, thank you again, Peter, for your talk.
So now uh, we start with the discussion. And as promised, uh, I will repeat the, uh, the practical um, point. So um, it's still important for all of you to, to uh, mute your video and your, your audio. Um, so when you want to ask a question uh, to Peter or raise a point during the discussion, you have to click the, the raise your hand uh, button or icon and you find this icon uh, in the calling bar uh, at the bottom of your screen. And when you're up, uh, we will write, write down your name and we will call your name and we ask you to switch on your audio and or your video. And just to remind you, please make sure to switch it off again when you're, uh, when you're done asking your question or raising your point. Um, so please, if you have any questions, raise your virtual hand and we will now uh, start the discussion. So the first question comes from uh, Joseph Townsend. So please go ahead. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, really interesting talk. Um, my question has uh, pertains particularly to what you mentioned regarding uh, 19th century, you know, return to um, uh, disdainfulness in a sense to local knowledge. Um, the question I have is, do you feel uh, uh, that uh, the reason why um, the experts in a sense, either historians or sociologists and so on, um, had this disdain was as a result of their audience, perhaps not being interested in local uh, knowledges, either, um, you know, the political elites not being interested or just general readership? Or do you feel that um, it's a kind of top-down uh, fact of sociologists, historians and so on, not being interested in local uh, knowledge meant that uh, nobody was learning of their importance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, did you hear the question? Or shall I uh, Yeah, I did hear. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I, I hesitate to give a general that would be a universalist answer to this um, difficult question. Um, there's been, um, there have been some interesting discussions by historians of India about the way in which British attitudes to Indian knowledge changed between the late 18th century and the middle of the 19th. So um, among the, um, when, when the um, East India Company uh, moved into India, its representatives there were often extremely interested in local knowledges. Our most famous case being the judge, William Jones, learning Sanskrit um, as well as um, the vernacular Indian languages and um, writing to tell um, Europeans um, about the cultural riches of India. But then um, early in the 19th century, you see a hardening of attitudes. And sometimes um, some historians have pointed the finger at the evangelical revival. So that um, the, the replacement of one form of Christianity with another one more intense, um, but less tolerant of alternatives than the, the lay Christianity of um, late 18th century uh, British colonists. I don't want to say that the explanation would, would be the same everywhere, but um, reading general studies like the ambitious studies of Jürgen Osterhammel, it would seem that the trend is general. The question would then be, um, does it have a general explanation or a series of local ones. Um, I, I haven't made up my own mind. I don't know enough to do so. Um, I would hope that people who know about other parts of the world would intervene 
um, as far as that this question is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, the next question comes from Ivan Mass. So, Joseph, could you please uh, turn off your uh, video? Ivan Mass. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was curious, like you pointed out the the beautifully the power relations between knowledge and the locality of knowledge but could you also apply it uh, to the temporal aspect of knowledge um, could you use it as a temporal um, methodology like for example uh, the disregard we have for medical uh, knowledge Sorry, I lost that one completely, but okay, Eva, that Eva. Didn't, didn't hear very well. Okay, could you could you perhaps repeat the question loud and clearly? Um, sorry, um, I felt that you beautifully represented the power relations between uh, knowledge or information and the locality of knowledge. But I was wondering if you could use it as a framework also for uh, the temporal aspect. So, for example, the general disregard that people have for medical, medical knowledge. Could you also use it temporally or is it only um, useful um, in a spatial aspect? So the question, Peter, um, uh, the, the question is, in your talk, you focused on what you could call this the spatial aspect of yeah. knowledges and the question referred to the temporal aspect so in terms of uh, uh not the spatial but the temporal is the, is is the our local knowledges or the study of local knowledges could we also understand that in a temporal sense i think that is the crux of the question okay i chose to focus on local knowledges in the spatial sense because the subject was already much too big but i would quite agree with you that there are <clears throat> there are parallels um, so that in the same space um, members of one social group maybe one with a higher status will either take seriously or not take seriously um, the knowledge of that other group so um, it's a similar story unfolding within a locality rather than um, this um, clash between um, localities. And I suppose one could um, discuss the relations between disciplines in this way, because uh, however much we try to think of disciplines as equals, very often, Practitioners of certain disciplines have thought of that their subject is superior to uh, somebody else's, and which restricts the possibilities of learning from that other discipline. So, in a sense, um, my talking about local knowledge was a local example itself of a wider cultural phenomenon. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Mara Burke. <clears throat> Hi, I want to thank you first, of course, for your talk. It's very interesting and very relevant at the moment. It seems to me that we treat these two groups, those who are in possession of what has been considered universal knowledge, and those who are in possession of what has been considered local knowledge asymmetri asymmetrically, such that we encourage those who have universal knowledge to take seriously the fact that theirs is one in an assemblage of local knowledges, while encouraging others who have local knowledge to make their knowledge more universal, like the movement to decolonize a variety of studies in the humanities and natural sciences. So I suppose the question is, is this 
asymmetry corrective in the sense that we're in a remedial phase where we're trying to atone for this fallacious divide that we've introduced? Or are we still prioritizing the universality of knowledge in trying to make these local knowledges more universal? Thank you. Did, did you hear I, the question? I, I would welcome your sum, summary, yes. Okay. So, uh, um, um, the question concerns the asymmetry between uh, the universal and the local. So, um, there's this tendency, so referring to your talk, of those who are focused uh, either by the discipline they're working in, the time they live in, etc., to, uh, to, to focus on the local, so to move from what is universal to also include or study what is local. But at the same time, people who have what we would call local knowledge to try and make their kind of knowledge more universal. So the question, if I repeat it correctly, was are we sort of in a remedial phase? So are we now uh, uh, making up for, for uh, sort of uh, um, an asymmetry in the past? Or are we still sort of in studying and in promoting local knowledge uh, local knowledges trying to make what is local universal so are we in studying local knowledges still uh, adhering or committed to sort of old dichotomy between the universal and the local well i think this is um, a special case of the, the problem of insiders and outsiders and and I think that when studying um, humans, at least, um, that we need to combine these two complementary opposite approaches. Um, the, the insiders have the deep knowledge and the outsiders can see that that knowledge is part of a wider whole and we need both. Um, we've always needed both, we will always need both. But um, at certain times and places, um, then there's been more consciousness of, of this than at other times and other places. Um, and sometimes the people who are, um, if you like, from, from the center, who are saying that um, we must learn from the locals, they think of that knowledge as raw material, which they can then digest and um, use in their intellectual system. But other people are prepared to say, well, maybe even my intellectual system ought to change after absorbing some of the local knowledge. Um, and, and, and it's certainly, um, I don't see it as my task as a historian to be saying, and particularly not to be generalizing about um, which of these attitudes is right or even the most useful. I only aspire to write the history of, of some of these exchanges. Um, and it may well be that in, in one area to use the um, inevitable spatial metaphor. Um, the, uh, there's one answer is valid, and in another area, another answer is valid. Yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Do you have a follow-up question or? No, I'm trying to think about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry, one, one question in between. I would like to ask uh, Cynthia Fork to switch off the, the video. You can search for it. Um, it's on the in the in the the menu on the bottom of the page. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next question comes from uh, Floris Cohen. Uh, 
Thank you very much for a, a very stimulating um, uh, talk, uh, uh, Peter. Um, I have also a question which turns around symmetry and asymmetry, and its um, starting point is the remark you uh, you made. You um, uh, cited um, a Cuban scholar uh, that not only Columbus uh, discovered Hispaniola, but that Hispaniola just as well discovered Columbus. So that raises the question, I think, um, whether uh, perhaps um, uh, the other side, to what extent it showed an interest in the knowledge of these people who came uh, came to them. To be a bit more clear, one example that is somewhat familiar to me uh, because I once reviewed a book uh, about it is the early 17th century uh, translation of Euclid's elements in, um, uh, in, in Chinese, um, which uh, under the tutelage of um, uh, uh, Jesuit uh, fathers, uh, familiar with um, uh, pretty advanced mathematics of their time, um, and there definitely was some, some interest. Actually, the translation was done uh, by, the, by um, uh, the Jesuit father together uh, with the Chinese um, uh, Mandarin, who was deeply impressed with the, um, uh, the whole idea of mathematical proof. Um, my question is, are there many examples of, and on the other hand, it remained fairly superficial. Um, very few Chinese were really uh, turned on interest and Euclid had to be retranslated all over again uh, way into the 19th century. My question is, are you aware of um, um, uh, many uh, cases where uh, such a reverse uh, interest uh, could uh, could be observed. I'm, I've got everything except the final question, I'm afraid. Could you repeat but, um, the last part? L Lucas will perhaps <laughs> paraphrase just okay. that last bit. Yeah. So the last bit was, but please correct me, Flores, if yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah. So the last bit was, are you aware of many or any uh, cases where the so the reverse order so where what we would call the local uh, showed an active interest in the knowledge coming from sort of the center. Uh, That's right. um, do you know any examples or cases where that happened, not only superficially but profoundly in a scholarly sense? Yes, indeed, I can think of uh, examples. Um, after all, the um, Jesuits in, in China were very interested in the different philosophies, not only those of Confucius, but Taoism as well. Um, uh, but, and, and I suppose, as is inevitable in cases where people from one culture reach out to um, texts or uh, people in another culture, that's the problem of um, perception or misperception, translation or mistranslation. Um, there's a famous passage um, where a Jesuit writing in Latin is explaining the contrast between yin and yang to a European audience. And he says, it's like the contrast between matter and form. So um, I'm in no position to say, has he simply imposed his Aristotelianism on the Chinese? Or is this a helpful analogy? Now, what, again and again, one has this problem of translation. Friedrich Schlegel writes about the wisdom of the Indians, um, but it is, his Sanskrit good enough um, to make sure that, that what he's communicating to his fellow Germans is really the, the message that had been sent by the writers in Sanskrit in the first place. Um, so on one side then one could be discussing willingness to learn, people with relatively open minds versus people with relatively closed minds. But among the people with relatively open minds, when one has then to raise the uh, a different problem, which is the extent to which they have translated the unfamiliar consciously or unconsciously 
into terms of the familiar. Um, the first problem, ideally, it could simply go away, even if this is unlikely to happen completely. The second problem, I suspect, will never go away. Yeah. Um, are you aware of cases where then uh, the reverse way um, a certain Chinese took a similar interest in, in European philosophy? Um, offhand, I can't think of one. I can think of an interesting case of mid 19th century Japan um, with a great, an interest in the philosophy of John Stuart Mill, especially his political philosophy. It was already in the 1860s that a translation was made of John Stuart Mill on liberty. So they, there you have the interest of the Japanese in the ideas of another culture. But then the problem, how do you translate the word um, liberty into Japanese? And then it turned out not to be a purely linguistic problem, it was also a cultural problem, because the term that was chosen, GU, um, that has negative associations, or at least it did in the middle of the 19th century in Japanese, I don't know about now. And it's understandable it had negative associations because uh, the Japanese dis have a tradition of distrusting individualism and preferring identification with the community. So they thought that liberty, that must be something selfish. And, and I, what I wonder is whether over the long term, which is now about 150 years or more, whether those negative associations have disappeared. That is, whether the Japanese have not only learned the meaning of a Western term, but are now prepared to entertain some alternative ideas of um, what is good in politics. I can't answer this question, but I think it's interesting to ask it. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I see that Maura Burke has her hand raised. Do you have a follow-up question, Maura, or was it by accident? No, Maura. Are there any other questions for Peter? So to repeat, if you want to ask a question or raise a point, you have to click the raise your hand icon. Yeah, there are a couple of questions now. <laughs> um, I think the first one was uh, Marie Yasunaga, please. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. Do you hear me clearly? I hear you. Do you hear her, Peter? Do you yeah, hear I me? Hear. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, put up some comments on your previous uh, point about the Japanese word to you how it's how, uh, if it have a negative or positive association in contemporary world and I think a selfish the term selfish has been another translated Japanese word so since then in the modern world especially under the post-war education system we did have a more positive uh, connotations to the GU the term liberty but it doesn't necessarily mean the actual like a very western notion of liberty has been implemented in the Japanese knowledge so it's very still um, layered understanding of liberty I would say um, well my question is actually coming from a different part of your talk so uh, I'm very curious about why you explained the positive evaluations of the early, early in the 20th century. You said it's a partial 
starts of returning, like a partial uh, uh, resurgence of their positive attitude towards the local knowledge. And you pointed out uh, one example is coming from the emergence of ethnology or anthropology. But when you think about when we think about how the ethnology or uh, ethnographic study were related to the administrative of the colonialism. Um, so I would like to ask you, how do you relate the universalism and localism or positive and negative aspects to each other in this particular period of time? Did you hear the question, Peter? Uh, I'm afraid I, I didn't hear it very well. Yeah. Okay. So the first, I don't know if I can can sort of recapitulate the first part <laughs> the same way you did, but the the first part related to the the, the Japanese word for liberty. Yeah. And, uh, a point was made that in the 20th, 20th century, especially in the education context, there has been a translation for the word uh, liberty, which doesn't mean selfish. But it also doesn't mean uh, um, what sort of the Western concept of liberty means. So it was a sort of critical remark on the on the idea that if the word liberty has been implemented in Japan in the 20s or 21st century, it isn't exactly uh, an implementation of a Western concept, but more a process of translation, a layered process of translation has been going on. So that was the first point. And then the question, uh, related to the fact that you uh, talked in your in your talk about the sort of resurgence in the 20th century uh, of say the positive attitude towards local knowledges, uh, mm. uh, referring especially to anthropology, but the question was, if I repeat it correctly, um, what about uh, colonialism? So what about the 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 relation between um, sort of claims to universality and an interest in the local? In the colonial context, how would you uh, uh, how would you consider that in the light of your your uh, your talk? Okay, thank you for the clarification of of um, the Jap of the Japanese concept of, of liberty. And now turning to this question, um, yeah, the history of anthropology is closely entwined with the history of colonization and colonialism. Um, the first lectures in anthropology given in Oxford and Cambridge were given in courses to train future colonial officials. It was only later that anthropology became a general uh, subject that anybody could study at the university. But there was a difference, I think, between uh, what the, the government wanted the officials to, to learn and what the officials actually learned um, and especially when they went out to Africa and or elsewhere um, and started to talk to local people. Um, and you can see in the course of the 20th century the, the expression of attitudes suggesting that people, uh, uh, that the natives, to use the term that people still used in the 20s and 30s, um, you can see a change from the attitude that they are inferior or that they are childlike to taking them much more seriously. And um, that goes with the acknowledgement, I think, of local informants as not just um, providing useful practical information, but really as educating the anthropologists, helping them to understand this other culture. Um, and so um, anthropology, which began, if you like, as um, a tool of colonizers, um, it, it provoked a critical attitude to colonizers. Um, Think, for example, of Jack Goody, who was doing his field work in what was still the Gold Coast in the early 1950s. But actually, he was making friends with people in the independence movement uh, 
and encouraging them. And um, something similar happened in India in the 1920s and 30s um, with some um, colonial administrators um, who had taken anthropological lessons to heart um, and uh, were themselves critical of British rule in India. Um, these are cases of what historians are very familiar with, unintended consequences. So um, when the government asks for its officials to be trained by anthropologists, uh, they never guessed what, what some of the results of that training might be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next question from uh, Rosanna Baars. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? You have to speak up a bit because it's quite... Uh... Okay. Can you try again? Yes. yes. Perhaps if I use this one, can you yeah. hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Burke. Um, I just want to pose a short question. Um, people are nowadays talking about uh, a crisis in expert knowledge. Would you say that the shift to local knowledges would solve this crisis in a way? Did you hear the question, Peter? No, no I got this, the, the phrase crisis of knowledge, but then I didn't get the question about it. The, the question in, in short was, people say that there is a crisis in expert knowledge, and then the, the suggestion was, could the move towards local knowledges uh, solve this problem? I suppose to answer properly, I have to decide whether I believe in a crisis of knowledge. Well, um, in citizens, I'm sorry, citizen believing, um, um, uh, not um, believing any more experts or, you know? Yeah, so so the, the point is not a, a general crisis in knowledge, but uh, the fact that citizens tend to have very little trust in expert knowledge. And the suggestion then is, if we focus more on local knowledges, could this help solve the problem of a lack of public trust in knowledge? Yes, and in the same way that I think citizens would be more involved in affairs if uh, more government activities were decentralized at the level of cities rather than the whole nation. Um, because even in small countries, local conditions um, can differ quite a lot from one province or county to another. So, um, yes, um, uh, um, I, I would be happy with that, um, um, that comment, although this is um, territory I don't mean to be um, speaking or writing about myself. I haven't got the uh, local knowledge that would permit me to do that. Thank you. Um, we have time for one other question. So if someone has a question or wants to raise a point, please do now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see only the surname Schulte Nordhold. Hi, yeah, Larissa is, is the first name. Good. So um, I was wondering about the binary that you were talking about at the very beginning of your talk, uh, which was really, um, really stimulating. And I was wondering if you have a binary, if you create a binary between universal knowledge and local knowledge, how then do you get past the problem that there is always more local knowledge to include, right? There is um, never an end to what is local. There is, for instance, your, your, your mention of the wise man of Dogon, you could say that those were still elite knowledges in a way. So how do you get past that idea that if you want to decolonize knowledge, if you want to include a critical attitudes towards knowledge, there is no end to that inclusion, so to speak. Is that a problem? And can you solve that problem? You have to solve that problem. Uh, so how, how to get on the binary a bit more, I guess. And I hear someone's, I hear a bell going off, so I'm not sure. That's, I don't think it's on my end, but... Um, 
Is it your phone, Peter? Or no, I'm afraid the telephone went off, and um, the sound of it made it very difficult to listen to the question. It's, All right. it's stopped now, luckily. Okay, um, yeah. okay repeat <laughs> me for the rest. Can you repeat the question just briefly, maybe? Right. So I'm wondering if there is a if we create a binary between universal knowledge and local yeah. knowledge. Yes. How do we get past the fact that there is always more local knowledge to include? If we want to be critical of knowledge and decolonize knowledge in a way or decolonize the humanities, how do we get past the fact that including critical attitudes, it never ends? There's always more local knowledge to include. And I was using the example of the, the wise men of Dogon uh, that you mentioned and the fact that these wise men are in, in some way still part of the elite. Right. And so there is always in that uh, uh, example, there is still more local knowledge to include. And so how. So my question is, is that a problem that you cannot that there is always more? And if it's a problem, how do we get past it? But it may not be a problem. <laughs> OK, so I'm in favor of taking local knowledge is seriously, but that doesn't mean that we should accept local knowledge is uncritically. Um, and indeed, it might be a good idea to disaggregate the concept of local knowledge, since people in a given locality may not agree one another about local phenomena. Um, so um, that would reduce the dichotomy a bit. And of course, some, some people um, are more interested in generalizing than others. Um, the anthropologists uh, that I mentioned um, were well aware that they had particular informants who, because they were particularly intelligent or because they simply had parallel interests to the anthropologists, they were much better guides to their culture than the majority of people in that culture. So one's, one's got to build all this in. Um, the, the only um, asymmetry that I think um, can't be um, subverted is the one where um, uh, physicists don't have a dialogue with the light or sound that they study. Um, and ethologists who would like to have a dialogue with the animals, they can't. But um, anybody that is studying humans, then the possibility of, of not treating people as an object of study, but having a dialogue with them about their knowledge, that, that is always a possibility. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's now five o'clock. Um, so that means that this is the end. Uh, of this meeting, um, I would like to uh, I would like to end with um, uh, a couple of thanks. So I would like to thank all of you, the audience, uh, for joining. I would like to thank the the Card Center for their support, and of course, uh, again, Peter Burke for his fascinating uh, talk and stimulating discussion. Um, so I was very happy uh, how it went, and I hope uh, you are all too, including you, uh, Peter. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention to um, uh, our website. So this is a regular series every two months. So you can uh, go to uh, our website, historyofknowledge.nl, and you can uh, uh, check out the uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, in the months to come and in the uh, next uh, year. So, um, I hope to see uh, all of you, the audience, uh, next time. And I would like to thank you, Peter, again for, for being here, yeah, for sharing this like. talk with us. Uh, and I hope to uh, see all of you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you, a pleasure to participate. And I'm very happy that it works. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, goodbye.
Bye.